Welcome back to Families in Action on the Hometown Station AM 1220 KHDS. I'm Kerry Question with Michael Dwarty, the Silver Fox, and we have in in here in in studio in studio Sage and her mother Tanya. So I was saying before we went on break, I've been clean and sober myself 36 years. And, I, and my father, growing up the whole time, he was he was never sober. He was in and out of our lives. I mean, mm. in for a month, gone for five years. And that's really the kind of way it was. Mm. And when he was, we used to wonder, is he going to even be alive in the morning? Seriously, because of the, the, the drinking and the drugging. He'd call me and I would, I would go to bed saying, okay, he won't be alive in the morning, but he always seemed to. But at 47, he passed away due to substance abuse, really. Boy, that's he, young. It was really young. Mm. So, but and one of the last things he said to me, and I and I, I, the day he died, was first I'm sorry, and two I wish I could have gotten sober t- with you, and three was I wish drugs weren't so important to me. Mm. I'm so glad was, you got to hear that anyway. Yeah, Kerry. well, you, at, you know, later on in life it meant it, it meant a lot, but I always knew it was the drugs. Mm. It was. I mean, that's what it was when drugs to, to uh, make good people do bad things and turns mm-hmm. good dreams into nightmares, and we know that. Yeah. <laughs> and the only thing that makes us feel better is more drugs until it stops working. Yeah. And my dad was an alcoholic, and right. he said to me one day, he said, "I wish I could be a." drinker but if I drink one beer I have to have all beers and that's just the way it was so the reason I'm saying that is because Tan, Tan, I'm gonna have Tanya tell us just a little bit about her story and, and then we'll we'll go from there okay um, where do I start I I currently have five years clean see that is Woo! so freaking cool Sept- it, it really is September 17 2011 I had enough so, and I had spent years before that in and out of uh, recovery, in and out of, in, you know, different rehabs, as you know. Yes. Um, and all the while uh, dragging my three children through that. What does that mean? Talk a little bit about it. I don't want to put you on the spot. No, it's... it's I, I just wanted people to uh, hear it. I like how you talked about the opiates and stuff like that. Um, I mean, throughout my life, I struggle with different things, but... Um, it really got serious when um, I had surgery and I had to take uh, Vicodin. Right. And um, I didn't realize, because even in my past in my using, I didn't realize the effects of the opiates. And um, I was taking them regularly, like I said, like I was told to. And then, um, you know, it would run out and I'd be like, oh, I'm still in pain. So I'd go to the doctor and they'd give me more. Mm -hmm. I did this for a year. And then um, all of a sudden it wasn't enough. The doctor said, you should be fine now. And um, I started getting them from other people. Well, you had to. Yeah, I did. And and I didn't understand at the time um, the the um detox part of it like i didn't know See, why that's I where that's where as a society we're lagging right now mm-hmm. because we're giving pain medication to people that are in pain mm-hmm. but we're, we're not really doing explaining mm-hmm. the addictive addictive part of these pain meds i mean their, their doctors are saying be careful they're highly addictive but they're not saying you're going to build up a tolerance you're going to need, instead of one, four, if you keep taking them, you're going to go into a depression. I mean, there's so many different things that they don't know. They, I don't even know that they doctors know. know about, hey, if you take a bunch of opiates, you're going to get depressed. They don't You're know. going to get constipated. You're going to have issues. You, I mean, things are going to, you're going to have to doctor shop. Yeah. After you doctor shop and they go on the computers and see your doctor shopping, you're going to have to hit the mm. streets. I don't believe that doctors, and, and this isn't a slide at anybody, um, just my experience is that they have a full understanding of addiction. Right. Um, I've been in a doctor's office and explained to them that I'm in recovery, and so I, I don't take narcotics. Um, and then and then they'll be like, oh, you'll be okay with this. And, yeah. and I tell them I'm in a 12-step program, and and I have to explain that. And to me, it's just yeah. they crazy don't get it. that they don't even... People who don't have the addictive personalities... People who don't understand, they cannot understand that when somebody that does have it takes a drink or a pill or smokes a joint or whatever it is, it 
snaps. Something in our brain clicks and gets triggered and we're off to the races. Yes. And it's not even that people that are addictive want to go and do it. But once they take that first hit, drink or pill or whatever it is, they're off to the races. Our brain is triggered and, and it's different than other people's. And you can't explain that to somebody who don't get it. Mm -mm. I mean, I, I, I can't even think of a way. You can't. No. You can't. So you're right. People that don't have that personality can't get it. So the only thing that works for people like us, I'm one, right. is not doing it. Because once we Absolutely. start, you all hear that corny things, one, one's too many, thousands never enough. Because once we, like your father, once he said he has that first beer, he's got to have 10 more. Mm -hmm. It's just the way our brains are, the chemistry in our brain is. So it's just one of those kind of things. So you woke up one day. Um, well, just in doing that, um, it led me to even more drugs and different types of drugs and which really, um, cause I was trying to get off of the opiates and I thought, Oh, well this would be better, but it right. was not. And, um, I spent the next few years, um, just completely hibernating basically in my room, doing my drugs. And, um, so you can relate to, I said, it's a disease of loneliness. Absolutely. Because you lock yourself Isolation, up. guilt, and shame. And every time I would use, which was constantly, like I, I think about, you know, we say one day at a time. And in, in reality, for me, I couldn't get through an hour without putting something right. in my body. And, um, you know, the saddest thing was, you know, my children outside my door and um, sliding notes under the door to me because I was not participating in their lives. Sage, Sage that must have been horrible. Well, I, I would. Well, no, wait. I want to hear from you. Yeah. What do you think? Because um, I remember the reason I'm saying this because I remember with my own father worried about is he going to live? Is he going to die? What's going on? And then I remember saying to myself, and we'll talk about this again in a minute. I'll never be like that. Yeah, definitely. Um, I remember that's half the reason I I wanted to do something. I remember saying I didn't want to be like that. But mm. me, when we used to slide the notes under, me and my um, little brother, we used to pretend it was like a game. Of course. You know, like back then, it was, I didn't really understand the like extensiveness of the disease. I was like, I think I was like 10 or 11 years old, you know, right. and um, like we used to like make it a game. We used to make everything a game and we'd just laugh about it because it wasn't just like me and my brother that would live in the house. We also had my cousins and all all these kids. So right. we we had we we tr did our best to try and have fun with the situations that were in well, front of us. We had to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that was how you that was the, you didn't mm -hmm. have any other ways of coping. Yeah, exactly. And and you know, it's scary when you know your mom's in there and who knows really what's going to happen when you're laying down at night, you turn out the lights mm -hmm. and your head starts. It's one of those horrible feelings. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty no, because I'm no. so proud of it's, you and I'm sure true. she is. I used to I used to stay up and wait for my mom to go to bed. I remember right. Do you remember that? Like we I used to sit and hide upstairs like on this little futon we had in this loft right and my mom and her friends would be downstairs that we all lived together uh -huh. and like i'd sit there and i would well, just like listen because yeah because be i will I, I don't know honestly like i didn't really get into the psychology of it i just wanted her to come to bed with me you know we went to make sure she was okay yeah mm -hmm. and like and then like they would see me and they'd be like go to bed sage and i'd be like man like i'd hide again and then i'd come mm -hmm. back out I mean, it's, 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 but that's the way it is when most children that are watching their parents go through this I I mean, we want to protect our parents. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We almost become the parent mm -hmm. in, in the relationship. Um, so you said you never want to be like that. Yeah, I remember. Um, but before you go there, put a stop on that for one minute. What happened? Why did you, you woke up one day and you said what? Enough? Well, actually, um, it got to a place where I was, um, the Department of Children's Services removed the children from my custody. Gotcha. And it was one of those things. I ended up homeless. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, I had a car, so I lived in my car. That's homeless, but yes. Depending on your perspective. Um, you just get to change your address right? Every night. Constantly. It's uh -huh. my, you know. Anyway, so um, they removed the children from my custody, and I just remember I had a week of what am I going to do? And I, and, and you would think you wouldn't contemplate that as a parent, but I did. I said, okay, I can be free and use and do whatever I want now. Um, or I can stop. And it took me about a week. I went to court and realized the severity of it. They were not going to give me my kids back. 
Um, just loving them is not enough. Right. You have to take care of them in a way that's, you know, safe. And I just remember one night uh, I was sleeping in a field in Santa Clarita, and I just remember crying and looking up into the sky and saying, this is not how my life was supposed to be. And this isn't, and I just kept repeating that over and over. And the next morning I, I went to a meeting. So, and, and, and you, I've been clean ever since. And you haven't turned around, huh? No. Hey, do me a favor, hug your mom for me. <laughs> I would, but I'd have to crawl over Mike and I don't want to do that. <laughs> you know, I know if it, for people listening, they're going, oh my, how could all that happen? And how could somebody let that happen? It happens every day. It does. And it's not even the person, it's the drugs. It is. But, 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 you, but let me just, there are so many people that call my center every day. And um, they lost their kids. And they don't do, they want to do things about it, but they don't. You've done something about that. Yeah. You got yourself five years. You took care of business. Your kids are back in your life. So yes. I can't give you more pops. Do me a favor. Pick your hand up like this. Put it behind you. Pat yourself on the back. <laughs> <laughs> because you deserve that. Thank you. Because I deal with people all day long that don't do what you did. Right. And I see that, too. I know you do. It's not easy, but it's possible. It's probably the hardest thing you ever did. It is. So, Sage, I'll never be like that. I'll never do it. What happened? You were walking down the street. You looked up into the sky. No? No. Um, I, don't, I don't know. I guess it was just comfortable to be in that place. Um, my addiction really didn't, like, show its, like, face until, like, I really got into the system like after when DCFS took you like took me away. Where'd they put you, honey? Um, I moved from house to house, mostly it being my own fault because like all of a sudden I'm a victim. Um, this is not my fault, blah blah blah. I deserve all this. And so I started like smoking a bunch of weed and like drinking a bunch of alcohol. How like, old how old were you? I was a uh, freshman in high school when it got really bad. I mean I started when I was younger, but it got like bad mm. in high school to where it was an everyday occasion. Right. And um, so I was like maybe 13, 14 when it got really bad. And um, I would smoke every day before school. I was smoking cigarettes all the time. I had already been smoking for a while, but I was like really smoking cigarettes. You know, I was finding you just kinda, you buy just kinda, it for me. You just kind of gave up. Yeah, like high school was like easier. There was a cool crowd, mm -hmm. you know, like that I wanted to be like. Yeah. And the my, easiest my, way was to be like that. <laughs> I guess my guess is you were you just found a place to fit in. Exactly. You were looking exactly. and looking and it's and, and that's what I always say. It's so easy to fit into that crowd. Yeah, it is. All you have to do is have something and then yeah. you're their friend. Give me a hit, dude. Okay, done. Yeah. I love you, dude. And exactly. It's everybody's I mean, it really is kinda like a family. Mm -hmm. It's a lot easier to get into that group than it is to like actually like because you have to go like go out of your way to get into a club go out of your way to be on a team sport to be on that yeah. and then, then it's just a lot easier to walk to the park and just be like hey i have money let's go get mm. drugs and they're like oh yeah. you're a part of our group you don't have to have this picture perfect partridge family exactly you don't have to get straight a's you don't have to be a job yeah. All it, was you have almost, to it was almost like the worse you were as a person the like more popular you were in the group right. <laughs> and remember bad self-esteem attracts bad self-esteem exactly meaning when things are bad and you don't feel good about yourself or what's going on you attract those people which helps you stay in that spot exactly and then when you all start partying and using it's kind of like okay here, mm -hmm. we, here we go we're off to the races so it started innocently do you yeah. remember the first time you got high um can you remember that see i can't <laughs> I, I honestly I, I can't I remember the first time I got high I didn't get high like right. I tried to get high but it was like it right. was like I didn't know what I was really looking for right um it was before it was like junior high I remember I remember the people it was with actually and like we were like smoking weed out of a pen cap Right. Like it was so like stupid, and I got so like paranoid. I buried a lighter in the in like the park somewhere, Very and I was light. like really scared. I like smelled really bad, but it was like, I remember like they were like, "Oh, this is your first time. Oh, we can't like definitely we gotta smoke you out." Like it was like a big deal. It wasn't like, "Oh my God, no, don't touch it." It was like you're gonna be Imagine inducted. Imagine today now with marijuana being legal and these kids all over and parents not thinking it's a big deal and society giving up on it saying okay let them smoke what's really going to happen think about that yeah i mean it used to be it was like it was like weird if you didn't smoke weed i remember that and now like i can't even imagine what's going to happen now like 
I'm sure it's just. Are you gonna worried be about it? How old are you? I'm 19. Are you worried about kids? I have a little brother in high school right now. <laughs> so, I mean, he's a freshman in high school. I'm very worried. Like, yeah. um, I mean, ad addiction obviously runs in our family. Obviously. You know, mm -hmm. and even if he's not an addict, like, I still want him to focus on school. I want him to have that opportunity that me and, like, my big brother didn't have. You know, I don't want him to be kicked out of schools and have to go to, like, five different high schools. Like, uh -huh. you know, like, I want him to succeed just as much as my mom does, you know? What drugs did you end up using? Um, um, at the end, when I got clean, I was addicted to methamphetamines. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Do you remember, here's the addiction process or we, we start breaking contracts i'll never smoke cigarettes because cigarettes will kill me mm -hmm. and then we're hanging out with these cool people or some, whatever we learn it from home and one day we you want one no one one no okay why not yeah and then we say well it's only a cigarette i'll never smoke weed but weed's only it's natural and we say oh what the heck and we smoke it but i'll never use hard drugs and we mean it somewhere down the line we break all that what yeah. happened it was so weird, actually. I remember that day, like it was yesterday. Like, I told myself I'd never use the drug that my mom used. Like, right. you know, I told myself I'd never would. And that was your benchmark. Yeah, and then it was so easy to just give it up. I was like at a park one day. I had been doing cocaine and like ecstasy and all those like party drugs, you know. Right. And like, one day we're sitting at a park. It's like two in the morning, and like, someone just says, "Hey, I have this." Do you want to use it? And I said, yeah. And you, I just you already straight, were high. Uh, yeah. All the, all the, everything just went out the window. Like it never even mattered. And, and like the boyfriend I was with at the time was also using, but he was like, no, no, she can't do it. So I remember it was the first secret I made. Like I, like I was texting this guy. I was like, Hey, meet me at the bench. So we went and we ran and like, it was the first secret I kept, but it felt so comfortable. It felt so natural just yeah. to hide everything and then that was the first day that like the next day i was doing it every single day See, that's what i want you to explain to people that if you have an addictive personality and you use one of those drugs one time you're addicted oh yeah the I next mean, day off and, running. and you know it right then mm -hmm. without a doubt it, it's like bang i'm done and i know it but i love this so much mm -hmm. it was it was it was just, I remember, I just felt like home, you know? Uh -huh. Like home, wow, that's a way, a good, good way to put it. Mm -hmm. It just felt so comfortable, didn't it? Yeah. What happened, though? It turned on you? Well, yeah, I mean, um, I had left my mom's house two, two months prior because... I didn't like her rules anymore. She got you know? she got sober and became and, a and mom. She, and she, uh, yeah, yeah, she had a couple. Tough. She, she had a couple <laughs> years clean, and I remember that was so unnatural. Like I had come out of the system, my mom was clean, and all of a sudden there's rules now, and I'm like, wait, what are you talking about? You know, uh -huh. and like, so like I tried to stay clean. It didn't. I didn't do it. Like I, I went and I lied about being clean. I lied about taking cakes. You know, mm -hmm. I think I made it eight months before I was like, you know what? Like, no, I'm done. You know, and um. And I didn't tell anyone. And then finally, like, as the, because the behavior is still there if you're not doing anything well, about if you, it. If you're using. Yeah. yeah. And like, my mom, like, started calling me out on it. And I was like, what are you talking about? All defensive, you know, how we get. Yep. And uh, blaming, she was like, well, blaming everything yeah, and everyone. And, and she was like, well, I'm sending you to rehab again or like some, like, and I was like, no, you're not. And I left and I like, and I like said all these crazy things that weren't true. And, all right. And, um, and then I didn't go back for a while. And somebody that's just 19, I mean, I've known you for a long time. Mm -hmm. You've been through a lot. Well, yeah, most of it I put myself through, though, no, at I'm the end. No, I'm not blaming anyone. <laughs> you know? I'm just saying you've been through a lot. You've done a lot since for somebody your age. Yeah, I, just, I don't feel 19. I feel like, like with the amount of stuff that's happened, like... Yeah. I, I feel like I've been through years already. Mm. So what, what happened? Why did you just really decide no more no moss no more using yeah. um i remember i was had just gone through the boyfriend through everything you know and uh i remember feeling desperate like for the first time i was actually i had made because my mom had made the decision that i was desperate people have made the decision that i was desperate but i have never really come to terms where I don't want to do this anymore right. because finally I had no mom. I had nothing that I could lean on for help. You know, like she was there, but she was not going to allow me to destroy my life. You were in lousy relationships. Yeah, I was in I lousy relationships. Doing lousy stuff. Yeah, and it was, it was, 
I was scared. You know, I was sad. I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. And, like, I'd finally had to, had my mom, like, she would, she was, you know, a phone call away, you know. and uh, I'm sure. And I was like, okay, I don't know what to do. And I was like, I need to talk to you guys. And I sat there and I was like, I don't. I don't want to do this with my life anymore. You know, like I don't, I don't know what to do. And you know, I kind of kept some details out of what was re like really yeah. going on, but it kind of like, you know, scratched the surface. I'm not, I'm not even, yeah. gonna, I'm not even gonna push you now. <laughs> yeah. for that. I don't even want to know. And um, but they were like, okay, we need to talk about it. It wasn't like a quick, yeah, sure. Like they needed to talk about it because of the destruction I had put through that, they like put them through. Yeah. You know, I went through their lives like a tornado so many times mm -hmm. that this time was not. They were like, this is gonna be different. So what's different this time is your desperation. Yeah, this time I wanted to get clean. Do you know? Close your eyes. Just stay there for a second. Think about drugs and what would happen if you did it again. See, that kept me sober for many years. She reacted rather instantly you to could that see, one. Well, you could see it. You could see yourself going, can't you? You're off to the races. Yeah, everything would be gone. Just fast. Everything. Can't you see it? Yes, everything I know um, literal, literally and what I can touch and what I can't touch, it, it would be gone. And I... I think that would be for anybody who's in that See, situation and if we remember that and we remember the desperado feeling that we had that'll keep us sober for for quite a while and 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 from then and and we have to now make choices getting sober and you guys can help i know we have to go on a break in a minute but getting clean and sober is easy we just got to change everything <laughs> our it. friends our playgrounds our toys and mm -hmm. then our thinking changes with that so getting sober is easy. We just got to change everything. And you know how when you were out there getting using your dope, you'd be willing to do anything to get it? Oh, yeah. You have to be willing to do anything to stay clean. Mm -hmm. Then it becomes easy. When it comes from here to here, it's easy. Uh, I mean, I can't tell you both how proud. How much time have you got now? I will have 10 months on the second. Mike, and we got five years, and then we have 10 months. Is that cool or not? It's very cool. You know, uh, Tanya said something earlier that that really struck me, and and that is, if a if a listener's out there saying, I, I wonder, I can't imagine the desperation. You said that when you found yourself homeless, that you had that moment where you thought, Hey, I'm free. I can just get high and not worry about my family or anything else. Power of drugs. Can you imagine now? Now you 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 have a hard time imagining that now, right? The yeah. power of drugs. I couldn't imagine. See, the thing is, the things I have in my life today are not things I ever knew that I could have, so I couldn't have even dreamt of them. And and it, must, it must have been really tough for you to see this mirror image of you. It was, it your was daughter devastating. Going, what was that? It was devastating. Hmm. You both got teary-eyed. Were you and your mom was talking? You, got all te you, you were holding it back? Yeah. <laughs> and you when she was talking. But you also have a, this, this bond that a lot of moms and kids will never understand because you both suffer from the same disease and you both know that it could be a great life or it could be taken away in a minute. So let's keep this great life, huh? Yeah. And then no, I think it's time for a break. This is Families in Action on your hometown station, AM 1220 KHDS. Welcome back to Families in Action on your hometown station, AM 1220 KHDS. And all I have to say is what a powerful, what a powerful, dynamic duel you guys are. I'll say. Now, aren't they? I mean, I can't tell. I've known you both for a long time. And to for you to have five years clean and sober and you to have nine months, I can't tell you how proud I was. Wait a minute. Ten months. It's almost ten him, minutes, yeah. Right. You. I was going there. <laughs> I mean, I can't tell you how proud I am of you guys. And, um, so talk to this. Okay, I'm a mom for a second. There's, there's, a, there's a mom out there right now or a dad that is listening to this show. And they're saying to themselves, maybe talk to that person. Um, I mean, honestly, if you're listening, and I've got two parts of this, um, as a parent, or just a person who may be struggling with this, there is help out there. Uh, you just have to be willing and um, 
at some point you, you the desperation is enough and you'll be willing and as a as a parent of a child who goes into this situation um, boundaries need to be set immediately weed is not okay drinking is not okay smoking is not okay you don't need to be their friend you need to prepare them for the rest of their life and it starts early and they're no longer your little babies they need somebody to direct them and and you can be that person in their life you should be that person in their life be the hero you want for them be the, be the role model you want for your kid yes walk like you talk exactly like you are you're walking like you're yes. talking be the example yeah so sage um well uh if if you're young and you feel like it's okay to use you know and it's just a party and it's not going to get bad and this is just a phase and I can stop anytime I want. And you can stop anytime you want. You don't have to think that way anymore. You know, you don't have to use even if you want to. And that saying, as cliche as it is, has gotten me through the days that make me, that I want to use. I can't, I, I used to think that not using, I would have no fun in life. And I can tell anyone who's listening out there that me being clean has been the funnest time of my entire life. At 19. At 19. I go to college. I I go I go to events. I I have I have family time. I have a job, and I don't have to use through it all. And I still have more fun than I ever had when I was getting high. And both of you, when you go to bed at night, you turn out the lights. How do you feel? Oh God. Proud. It's insane. You're not putting mo notes under your mom's door. <laughs> no, there's no notes. <laughs> Unless it's a Valentine's love card you notes. or something. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I don't shut my door anymore. Mm -mm. And it's one of those things that I, I don't do is at night when we're going to bed, I make sure the door is open. And you it guys, stays open. I can't tell you how terrific the show was and how powerful it was for mm -hmm. the people that are listening. So thank you. Thank you. And um, I want to have you back like every, whenever, every 60 days or so. I'm serious, <laughs> both of you. And um, I want Mike to, thanks again for being here. And I want Mike to talk about next week's show. Oh, next week is going to be powerful as well. Carrie. Uh, powerful, Cameron. but not as powerful. I'm Cameron, sorry, yeah, Cameron. I hear you. I hear you. You can't, you can't <laughs> take, you can't top these guys. Cameron Smythe, our, 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 uh, our mayor. The city council decided during the January 25th meeting to extend an existing moratorium that bans the sale, cultivation, and manufacturing of recreational and medicinal marijuana, and we're going to have him on the show Monday to talk about that. Carrie. How exciting is that? But more exciting is look at them. If you're not, if you're listening right now, you got to watch this. On Facebook. Go to YouTube. Yeah. No, it's not on Facebook. Go uh, to yeah, YouTube, YouTube or um, Channel 20 on Time Warner next Monday at 4 o'clock. That's when we're on. Oh, yeah. But, I mean, they're, like, hugging and mom's yeah. rubbing her shoulder. And now mom's just gave her put tears in my eyes. I yeah. know. It's like, come on. What are you doing here? So <laughs> it, it doesn't get any better than that. So thanks again for being here. And I imagine it's time to close. So, Mike, would you like to close us? Well, Carrie, you know, this is great because we're, we're able to lead today and say there is hope. There You've been definitely. listening to Families in Action, and we've been talking about the road to sobriety with Sage and her mom, Tanya. Right here on KHTS AM 1220, we'll be back next week with Mayor Cameron Smythe. You don't want to miss that.